All right, this sun season, evolve your sun care with new Banana Boat 360 coverage. With Advanced Control Mist, it's a new way to spray. It's an all-new bottle for an all-new mist experience that smells great and is incredibly light on your skin. You can even customize your spray. Like to cover targeted areas, you just tap the trigger lightly, or you can pull the trigger fully for a long, continuous spray, ensuring long-lasting Banana Boat protection. Plus, it's refillable. From sweat-resistant sport formula to kids' SPF 50+, plus, this is sun care that'll come in handy when my kids are swimming, playing sports, when I'm hiking, when we're out at the lake, or whatever it is that we're doing outdoors. Shop Banana Boat 360 Mist at Walmart, Target, or Amazon. The 24 Toyota Tacoma and Tundra both rank in the top 10 for resale value among all vehicles for 2024, according to Kelly Blue Book's KBB.com. So choose a Toyota truck and get the confidence that your vehicle will retain its value year after year. That's Toyota resale value. Visit buyatoyota.com. Vehicles projected resale value is specific to the 2024 model year. For more information, visit Kelly Blue Book's KBB.com. Kelly Blue Book is a registered trademark of Kelly Blue Book Company, Inc. Toyota, let's go places. The BMW i4 M50. It's 100% electric and 100% BMW. Experience the power of over 500 horses stampeding at a whisper as BMW M-engineered handling takes you through every twist and turn. The complete suite of intuitive technology keeps you connected. The pure performance keeps your heart racing. The BMW i4 M50. Silence has never said so much. BMW, the ultimate electric driving machine. When you have health insurance, it's easy to forget about your out-of-pocket costs. That can be a lot of money. But are your bills accurate? It's estimated over 50% of medical bills contain errors. HealthLock can help. HealthLock technology securely connects with your insurance and flags any overbilling, wrong codes, and fraud. You can even have HealthLock work on your behalf to get money back from select past bills. To date, HealthLock has helped its members save over $130 million. To save, visit HealthLock.com today. I won't let my body outweigh, outweigh everything that I'm made of. Won't spend my life trying to change. I'm learning to love who I am. I get strong, I feel free. I know every part of me is beautiful. And I will always outweigh. If you feel it, put your hands in the air. Show some love to the new while you're there. Let's take it one day at a time. Cause you and I outweigh. Happy Saturday, Outway fam. It is Nita Week, and I've got Kat Defada here with me. She's a licensed therapist that specializes in eating disorders. And Kat, do you want to just explain what Nita Week even is? Yes. Nita Week is the National Eating Disorders Awareness Week. So it is a week that is aimed to bring literally awareness to one of the biggest issues that we have in mental health. It's the leading mental health disorder in mortality rate. So it's really serious. And so this week is all about helping people get access to information and help. Yeah. Really. And I am thankful to have Kat here as the expert. I co-host the Outway podcast with Lisa Haim, who's a registered dietitian that is extremely passionate about this topic. Um, Lisa's not here right now. I've got Kat, me, Amy, and we're going to get into some questions that actually Kat was sent. She hosts a podcast called You Need Therapy. And because it's Need a Week, she was focusing on questions related to eating disorders. And so we're just going to get into some of the questions she used for her Couch Talks episode. And I hope that they are helpful for you wherever you are in your journey. That is what Outway is here for. It's to just be your weekly companion because I just remember in the throes of my eating disorder feeling very much alone. And thankfully we live in a world today where we can just be so, so, so connected. But even in a lot of the connection, oddly, we can still feel extremely disconnected. So just big hug from me. And I guess I won't speak from Kat, but go ahead. I'll give give you a big hug. Big hug from (laughs) Kat too. If you're listening to us while you happen to be running some errands or you're on a walk or you're trying to get some stuff done around the house, just like take this part in. You are not alone. There are tools out there for you. You can get the help that you need. And I think you'll hear from some of the questions. You got to be ready for it though. So when we get into the talk, Kat, you ready to go over the questions? Let's do it. So 
we're going to have some expert experience and some just human experience today. And I will say, we talked about, or I have, I don't know if, well, we talked about it on your podcast too, Dope Sick and how obsessed with that show I was. And if you have not watched that, I highly recommend watching it. However, trigger warning, it can be hard to watch. But it's all about the opioid epidemic. And, you know, something that we used to think, or it used to be true, is that addiction to opiates was one of the most deadly, like, mental health crisis that we had. But right now, the highest mortality rate of any mental health disorder comes from eating disorders. Wow. I did not know that. You didn't know that? No. Yeah. So, well, I didn't know it surpassed other things. Uh-huh. I, if you it had was two, told and me now to, it's one. you know, name three, yeah. I don't think I would have put it as a top one. Yeah. Obviously, I know that that's, mm-hmm. there's a lot of tragedy that comes from eating disorders, but I don't know. I just would figure other things would fall in line first. That's yeah. wild. It's, okay. Well, scary. so even more of a reason why this conversation or having these conversations, wherever you're having them, as long as, again, there's the expert involved it's important. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. So we better so get to the yeah, questions. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So I'm going to ask the question. I'm going to see if you want to give feedback first and then we'll just bounce and see what happens. Okay. 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 So the first question is, what are your thoughts on Overeaters Anonymous and um, using Vivance for binge eating disorder? Mm, okay. Well, I've gone to one Overeaters Anonymous okay. meeting in my early 20s and I never went back. I think I was just so thankful to know that I wasn't alone. Why didn't you go back? It wasn't somewhere. I Maybe there was still some shame. I felt uncomfortable. I didn't know anybody there. It was comforting again, like I said, to know. I think that like, honestly, I ate my way there. <laughs> like, I think I went to a gas station and I was like, I'm going to get all my snacks, you know, mm-hmm. whatever candies or cookies or whatever. I just know it was a particularly hard day and it landed me there. But I guess I just wasn't fully ready. You have to be ready for something like that um, and be committed. And I just didn't even know really where I fell, but nobody talked about overeating. The fact that- No, that that is true. This was early 2000s. So there wasn't this Instagram community where there was all these influencers you could follow that were being vulnerable and sharing with you about their, or not even just influencers, but experts Mm -hmm. or like hashtags where you can search things out. I honestly- don't even know that we really Googled a lot back then. Maybe I Googled it or maybe I saw it somewhere or looked it up in the phone book. I don't know how I even found this meeting, but I know it was in North Austin and I know that I went. It almost feels like a dream as I'm telling it Did it happen? Am I making this up? Right. Because sometimes you are in on the really hard days. It's almost like you are having an out of body. Mm -hmm. You're not connected. Yeah. Well, that's a whole... You're like a zombie. disconnects you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So... You went once and you the the goodness you got from it was that I I got this sense that I wasn't alone. I'm not alone. Okay. Mm-hmm. Which is amazing. Right. And I love that. And if that's what you can take from one of those meetings, then I'm all for it. I have never been personally a huge fan of these meetings. There's also something called EDA, which is Eating Disorders Anonymous, which encompasses all eating disorders that I'm really pro that. It's hard to find those meetings. Now they do do them online. Um, these days. But the reason that I'm not super into OA is because they have in the past. It could have changed. But when I was more familiar and when I had clients and people in my life going to those meetings, they did preach and encourage that you abstain from any food that you've binged. So it was like sobriety. So if your binge food was chips, then you're not allowed to eat chips anymore. And a relapse would be you eating chips, even if you're eating it in an appropriate way. I mean, I could get how for some people that might work if you have a specific binge food. But yeah, I mean, sometimes it really didn't. I didn't always stick to one food. Yeah. So So then then what do you like never eat? If if it was like candy, it's like, can you never have any candy again? And I just think that can be a really toxic way to find healing because it can that can just turn into another type of eating disorder. Right. It, It sounds very restrictive to me. Right. And the reason I think eating disorders are one of the hardest things to work with is it's you need a, food to survive. Yeah. And Is that it's what like, you're about to say? Yeah. Well, it's like you're teaching somebody how to like responsibly use their drug of choice, right? So it, it would be like if you came to my office and you're like, okay, I'm addicted to cocaine. I need to teach me how to like use it in a healthy, positive way. And that sounds crazy, but with food, we kind of have to do that. And so I'm not a huge fan of OA. However, if it's something that if you go into it, all you take from it is, oh my gosh, I'm not alone in this, go for it but be very mindful of what they encourage and what kind of like 
I want to say food. That's like a food rule to me. And yeah. Well, and I'm going to say they probably have overall yeah. themes that they follow or it's a, it's yeah. a 12 step program, but each chapter might, it might be full of different people and different relationships you might make. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Yeah. I'm just thinking of like, like I know people that do AA and they might go to one meeting and they don't like it there, but then across town, they'll drive 20 minutes to go to this other meeting because mm-hmm. it's a solid meeting mm-hmm. for them, like more impactful yeah. and like actually a good place for them. Okay, well, I just looked up some OA criticism and I don't really find any online. I mean, I'm sure I could hit There's up not Reddit like a and there could OA be like, a like group on Reddit that's like just bashing it. No. Not that I can <laughs> see at the moment, but also we're not here yeah. to bash like yeah. any particular thing because it might be helpful yeah. to somebody, but this is just... My- different things can yeah. work for different people. This is just what I've seen and how it's not been helpful in the way that I work for myself and with clients. It doesn't have the same kind of ideology behind recovery that I see work. But I think that speaks to just recovery in general. There's not one way to do it. Mm -hmm. And thinking that there's just one way to do it can get us in trouble. It's dangerous. Yes. Mm -hmm. So the other part of that question was, and I have some feelings on this, but what are your thoughts on using Vyvanse for binge eating? Well, I've taken that. (laughs) But did you take it for binge eating? Well, I took it for both. Knowing that I have ADHD Mm -hmm. and that I'm a binge eater. But did I relay the binge eating to my practitioner? No. I did it for the ADHD, but secretly deep down inside, I'm like, this is going to be my magic pill. Cause this one, I know I for sure saw commercials about, you know, I'd be watching something and then it'd be like, do you overeat? Wait, they had commercials for Vyvanse? Yes. I've never seen it. it. (gasps) This was probably 2015. I remember specifically work. I was working at a treatment center in an eating disorder program when it got approved. And I remember getting an article and it was very sad to me to read that article. But for you, you're like, oh my gosh, yes, I do. That right. could help me. I was like, this could help me focus and concentrate at work. But then also this this is going to be my cure to eating too much. And I would put myself 100% in that binge category. I did have a season where I wasn't purging in any way, mm-hmm. probably working out too much. I learned later in recovery that over exercising is a form of purging as well. It doesn't have to be actually the physical act of mm-hmm. purging. In fact, a book that I love that helped me in my recovery was called Brain Over Binge. And the author of it, she binged and purged, but her purging was always working out. Mm-hmm. She never that was mine. threw up. Yeah. So for me, though, I had like 12 years where I didn't throw up. So I thought I didn't have an eating disorder, Oh, but I was eating, like would ha- yeah. I would binge restrict, like I would mm-hmm. not eat and then I would just eat uncontrollably. But I learned a lot through brain mm-hmm. over binge that my brain was like, you don't give us food. Yeah, <laughs> You don't give, you're not giving me any food. So therefore when you do give me food, I'm going to eat the heck out of it because I don't know when you're going to feed me again. Mm-hmm. And so that's where I had to go in and break that cycle mm-hmm. But it was a mental thing. And I think one of the questions we get to later is going to talk about, Mm -hmm. I I have a mental answer for it of like what I just had to tell my brain. But with the purging, it did come back after my mom passed away in 2014. So I was still doing binge restrict, but then the purging had come back Mm -hmm. and I was desperate for anything. And that's when I started seeing the Vivian's commercials. And I'm like, this is my miracle drug. I'm going to be cured. I'm going to take this. My life is going to be better. Like I was convinced of that. Well, I had taken Adderall before and didn't have the best experience with it at all. But I thought, well, this is different than Adderall and it'll help me focus, which it did for a time. And then I was focusing like all day long because it's a, Vivian's is a time release. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And it was altering my personality. My mouth was still getting really dry like it did on Adderall. I started feeling comfortable. I was still swinging. I wasn't sleeping great. And also... I was still overeating. And so then I thought something was wrong with me. Like I'm yeah. broken. I'm this the one person. This drug didn't fix you. Right. I'm the person that yeah. can't take this pill. But again, I wasn't talking to a medical professional about that because I wasn't taking the pill for that reason. All right, sunny weather is upon us and the sun out means more time outside. My kids have sports. There's also swimming, hiking, going to the lake. And I'm always on the lookout for sun care that's easy for all of us. And that's where the new Banana Boat 360 coverage is coming to the rescue. 
It smells good. It is incredibly light on your skin. It is not greasy, which I think we can all appreciate. And it's an all new bottle with advanced control mist. It's a new way to spray. Better control means coverage that you can count on with a precision pump to get all your big and little spots. I mean, you can literally customize the spray. You just got to tap the trigger lightly to cover targeted areas, or you can pull the trigger fully for a long, continuous spray, ensuring long-lasting banana boat protection. Banana Boat 360 coverage is also aerosol-free, which is a plus in my book for sure. It's available in Banana Boat's high-performance, water-resistant sport formula, and pediatrician-tested kids SPF 50. You can shop Banana Boat 360 Mist at Walmart, Target, or Amazon. So I love traveling and coming home to my bed because it's comfy and familiar. I love crawling into it. Well, what if you could take your bed on the road with you so that way you got good night's sleep while you're on a trip? And it's not your entire bed, but at least your bedding, which is the best part. Let me introduce you to Cozy Earth's luxurious bedding. Now, Cozy Earth is travel-friendly and hassle-free, and the bedding comes in these adorable totes, which makes it really easy for you to take it on trips with you. They also have really amazing loungewear, so if you're on a long flight, you can stay cool and comfy with Cozy Earth's temperature-regulating bamboo joggers and pullover crew, and it'll add a touch of style to your travel ensemble as well. So whether you're exploring stuff near or far, take a little bit of home with you. Cozy Earth has everything you need to turn every moment into pure bliss. Discover your next destination for ultimate comfort at Cozy Earth. Visit CozyEarth.com and use our code OUTWAY at checkout to get 35% off. And let them know that we sent you after you check out. When you're in the market for a new car, you want a vehicle that conquers your daily commute, easily handles the elements, and looks great too. You need the reliability of a Toyota and the confidence that your investment will last. Why? Because after all the carpools, shopping trips, and weekends out, you want a car that still has plenty of miles left in it and holds its value for a great trade-in deal. That's where Toyota leads the pack, as the number one resale value brand for 2024, according to Kelly Blue Book's KBB.com. So check out the all-new fully redesigned 25 Camry, or test drive a stylish and affordable Corolla sedan or hatchback. And remember, when you choose Toyota, you're not just buying a car for today. You're investing in trade-in value for tomorrow. Visit buyatoyota.com, the official website for deals, for more. Vehicles projected resale value is specific to the 2024 model year. For more information, visit Kelly Blue Book's kbb.com. Kelly Blue Book is a registered trademark of Kelly Blue Book Co. Inc. Toyota, let's go places. You're probably careful with your personal information, but what about the other places that have it? Like the doctor's office that mixed up your files. They have your social security number. The power company that mistakenly cut your service has your payment info and last three addresses. And the hotel that lost your reservation has your passport info. Your information is in endless places out of your control. Any one of them could accidentally expose you to hackers and identity theft through lax security, breaches, or simple mistakes. But LifeLock monitors millions of data points every second and alerts you to a wide range of threats. If your identity is stolen, a U.S.-based restoration specialist will fix it, guaranteed, or your money back. With plans covering up to $3 million for stolen funds and expenses. Mistakes happen. Don't let not having protection be one of them. Save up to 40% your first year at LifeLock.com slash iHeart. That's lifelock.com slash iHeart to save up to 40%. Terms apply. Did you talk to doctors about binging ever? No. Because? No. Never. Shame. shame. Embarrassing. Mm -hmm. I didn't ever feel comfortable talking about that part. Of course, I was able to say to some people at certain times, I'm bulimic. Yeah. But there's like more shame. Well, I had shame in the bulimia, don't get me wrong. But there's was shame for me with overeating. Well, because it's this like out of the idea. It's like you're out of control. And I hate that because, and if anybody's listening to this, like all of these behaviors that we're using, whether it's restricting or binging or purging or you're purging through exercise, they're literally all the same thing. You're just picking a different one. Mm -hmm. And like the only reason I picked exercise over actually like throwing up is because I couldn't right. do it. Same thing. So it's like I would have been doing that. She couldn't do yeah, it. Yeah, I would have been doing that. 
And I just hate that like we've put different like labels of this one's good and this one's worse. And this is, I hear all the time, well, I wish I had that eating disorder and not that eating disorder. Yeah, like why couldn't I just like not eat? Yes, and it's like they're really mm-hmm. all the same thing. Right. And I just want you guys to know, listening, if you're struggling with binge eating, like somebody who's restricting is not any better than you at all. No, and- And, and it's not like they have more willpower than you because a lot of those people, I mean, I know for me in my most restrictive parts of my life, like I couldn't eat if I wanted to. Like I had no control. I didn't have the control to make a healthy choice for myself. So it wasn't like I was all like put together and all of that. So it didn't work for you. No, I ended up having to get off of it because not, it wasn't doing what it, what I needed it to do even for my ADHD. And it then was messing with me in such a way, because then, like I said, I felt like I was, something was wrong with me. And so then I'm like, I remember going back to pick up my prescription and then one time my prescription, like I couldn't get it and it was late and I was like freaking out because I'm like, I need this. I need this. And then that's a scary place to be because I didn't. So anyway, I got off of it and it wasn't for me, but I don't know your thoughts on it. So I have my own feelings and beliefs and thoughts on it. And it is not a one size fits all. Vyvanse for binge eating kind of feels a little bit like harm reduction to me. And there's a time and a place for that. I think that there's a time and a place for using different ways of helping someone heal for eating disorder based on that specific situation. So I'm saying all that very carefully because it's not a one size fits all. However, Vyvanse, the way that it is not designed to work for this because it wasn't designed for eating disorders, but the way that now it's prescribed is because it does suppress your appetite. So what it's not doing is teaching you any kind of connection with your body, any kind of connection, mind, body, spirit. It's not teaching you any skill. It's not allowing you to sit with discomfort. It's not allowing you to build agency and and power in yourself to make good choices. It's just suppressing your appetite. Well, and one of the big parts of my healing, and I say healing because I was having to, I'm still in a place of healing. I'm actively pursuing therapy and different things that I know that are good for me, mind, body, and spirit. Mm -hmm. So I think if I was someone that needed to take it in conjunction with a recovery process, but I was looking at it as a pill that was going to fix me. Yeah. When but then I what happens needed, if you don't take the pill anymore? Right. Or you go to the pharmacy and you can't get it yeah. that day. But I wasn't putting in the work to rewire. Like I had to rewire my brain mm-hmm. and that took work and that took repetitiveness mm-hmm. and hitting rock bottom and mm-hmm. just wanting that to be. And sitting in a lot of discomfort. Yes. And I had to kept, I revisited it sometimes like, five times in the same minute yeah. because I was retraining my brain. Yeah. And if I'm taking a miracle thing, which I do like what you're saying too, because if I, if someone might need something in conjunction with something else, but if you're thinking you just take something and it's like, voila, I'm going to fix everything. Mm-hmm. It's not, at least for me, because so much of my stuff was stuff I needed to actually work through. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I'm a big believer of medication when it comes yeah. to mental health. Like mm-hmm. I, all day long, yes. If if that's going to be something that is really positive and helpful for you, I support it. And every, like I said, every case is different. But if we're taking this just as an, like an easy way and I haven't really tried the other stuff, it does create another problem because what you're not doing is like healing the relationship with your body and healing the relationship your body has to like hunger cues. You're not actually helping get those back. You're deleting them. Mm -hmm. I'm in like year two of recovery and I'm still figuring out my hunger Hunger cues. cues. Yeah. Yeah. I'm okay with that. And I know that that's okay. And I know I I no longer have this mentality of like, oh, it's me. I'm broken. What's wrong with me? It's just like, well, I mean, what do you think? I confused my body for more than 20 (laughs) years. Like almost like if once I hit mid forties, if I hadn't have gotten the help that I needed, it'd be you're 30 in, years. I was going to say you're not in your mid 40s so. But I'm about to be. Oh. I'm about to be 41. <laughs> about to be your mid 40s. That's like when I say I'm in my late 30s and I'm 32. <laughs> okay, I'm four, I'm going to be 41 <sighs> next month. Okay. And I'm just saying in a couple yeah. more years, if I hadn't gotten help, I'd be living 30 years yeah. in, in, in a lot of agony. And, you know, we hear from on our Outweigh podcast, which is specifically for disordered eating 
conversations. We've had listeners that email us that are 60, 65 years old, and they've been living with it. And I then I, I then have gratitude for those that have gone before me and have been an encouragement to me in where I am. And I'm thankful that I cross paths with certain mm-hmm. people online that were a big part of my recovery. Lisa Haim being one of them with her well necessities program, Fork the Noise, so good. And the Brain Over Binge book, like I mentioned, and then even getting to know you. But I only learned about Brain Over Binge because I followed Kale Junkie, who I've never met in person. She like lives in California and sort of following her on Instagram. But she posted, but thank goodness she was vulnerable mm-hmm. about, about her story and posted about this book. You know what I want to say too? This goes back to something you said earlier when we're talking about OA is the most important healing agent in any of this stuff, really in anything we're struggling with when it comes to mental health, is feeling like you're not alone, is connection. That's literally the opposite of addiction. And I view a lot of eating disorders from an addictive lens. The opposite of addiction is connection. So the more that we're hiding from our eating disorders and we're hiding from our behaviors and and we're taking that blanket of shame and we're just like, you know, wrapping it all around us really tightly, the farther away we are going to get from like true, true healing. The more we can actually talk about this stuff, and that's one the point of this podcast. And I know outweigh, and I know that's one of the reasons that you do four things with Amy Brown podcast is so people feel like they're not alone. And right, but even in the beginning of that podcast, because that was before my recovery, yeah. I was hiding it. But well, now I was hiding it. No, but I was also spreading toxic, yeah. harmful, you, yeah. triggering information that I thought was quote unquote healthy. Yeah. And I was encouraging my listeners to participate, but now I know better. And that's the great thing. And now you know better and you're not being shame. What you're not doing is let shame just be like, well, I'll never do a podcast again, or I never want to talk about it. You're saying, yeah, this sucks. And I hate that I did that, but I'm going to like talk about it because the more I talk about it, the less shame I feel about what I've done. Right. And then it's just this also permission and reminder that we can all grow and evolve and learn and we don't have to be stuck. And yeah, there isn't shame if hey, yeah, I didn't have it all figured out by then. And you know what? I might say stuff now that Mm -hmm. three years from now, I might come back and be like, wow, I can't believe I said that. Me too. But yay, so glad I learned and grew. Yeah. We'll see. I don't know. Me too. Don't hate on people for change. We talked about this on, speaking of four things, I think the fifth thing when we quoted Charlemagne, the post he put up, which was delete the old version of me, it expired. (laughs) Amen. Amen. Except for all those podcasts are still up. (laughs) Can't delete them. (laughs) But that person has changed. Yeah. Okay. Question number two. Really question number three, but we're going to say number two. Uh, What is some advice on not slipping into bad habits when you're stressed? But I'm going to rephrase this a little bit. I am going to say, what is some advice on not slipping into maladaptive, unhealthy habits when you're stressed? Take that bad, the judgment out of it. Ooh, maladaptive. Do you want to look up the definition? Yeah. (laughs) Have you heard that word before? Okay. Not providing adequate or appropriate adjustment to the environment or situation. So not helpful. There you go. Mm -hmm. Love it. little therapy word. our word word. of the day. Word of the day. From a therapist. Um, Maladaptive behavior. Now you have to use that um, every day this week in a sentence. Well, let me just really drill it in here. Maladaptive behaviors are those that stop you from adapting to newer difficult circumstances. They can start after a major life change, illness, or traumatic event. It could also be a habit you picked up at an early age. You can identify maladaptive behaviors and replace them with more productive ones. There you go. Okay, so yeah, we're reframing the question. This person is looking for advice on how do I not go back into those like coping skills that I picked up that are no longer helping me when I get really stressed out, which might be when you're most susceptible to falling into old behaviors, right? Which could be eating disorder. Yes. Behaviors. It could be shopping. Yeah. It could be anything really. Men. Yeah. Women, whatever you choose to numb. Mm -hmm. Because for me, my eating disorder was just numbing, numbing, numbing all the time. Numbing. It wasn't a ther until a therapist in late 2020 that I had. And it was actually a therapist for my son that did intensives with the parents. I have an adopted son and adopted daughter, but I was working with him. And really when you have any child in your life that has had trauma, which I adopted older children. So that's a given. They've already been separated from their birth parents. They lived in an orphanage for years. There's trauma. 
So you have to be a healing parent. And in order for you to be a healing parent, if you're working with a therapist, they want to like see, let's where where are you? Where are you at? How can you be the most effective parent? Like, because if you don't dig deep and work on your stuff. So anyway, we're talking and he made me do that exercise where you're sitting in a chair and you talk to yourself in a chair, you know? Empty chair. Empty chair. Yeah. And we do this whole thing. And it came out in that session that, you know, my eating disorder started when I was a teenager. I was talking to my child self. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, my husband was there as someone that has spent much of my adult life with me. We've been married 15, 16 years. And he talked about how my eating disorder has affected our marriage. So then this whole, and I'm like, wait, I thought we were talking about being healing parents. But the truth is, just like I brought that eating disorder into my marriage, I brought that eating disorder into my parent-child relationships as well. And the therapist said, yeah, I mean, well, let's let's unpack this a little bit more because in his opinion, I'm curious about yours, he said an eating disorder is underlying depression. No one had ever said that to me before because I was like, well, huh? What? I'm not depressed. And he's like, well, yeah, you are. And eating disorders underlying depression. So I don't know your thoughts on that, but I do know that I was using my eating disorder for all of those years to numb pain so that I wasn't feeling. Mm -hmm. And then depression doesn't have to look like for some people it might, but for others, it may not be You're you can be like a functioning alcoholic. You can be like a functioning depressed person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've never Unpack heard that. I've actually never heard somebody say that. I can understand what he's saying in that. I think that I see eating disorders more as they can be like best friends with depression. They could exacerbate depression. Um, depression can exacerbate an eating disorder. But I, I hear what he's saying in that. What I was thinking as you were talking though is I believe that a lot of the things that we do in our eating disorders, these coping skills that we pick up they're solutions to problems, right? And so there's solutions to problems and at some point they're working and so we keep using them. And then at some point they start causing more harm than good. And like I said earlier, the addiction is the opposite of connection. And so if I'm really, really honed in on these behaviors that disconnect me, how is anybody in my life going to connect to me? How are my kids gonna connect to me? How is my husband or my wife or my partner gonna connect to me? I'm not connecting to myself. My behaviors are all rooted in cutting myself off and numbing. Right. So how am I going to expect people to be able to like get in there? But that's really all we ever really want. We want connection. So it's like the opposite. So I do believe that like not having that does just open up this perfect little like beautifully made bed for depression. Right. I mean, it may not be that it's what like he's what came first, the accurate. chicken or the egg. Right. Okay. Yeah. That's a good way to put it. I mean, really? Yeah. Which did. Well, do you I know? I have no idea. Okay. <laughs> Shoot. <laughs> do you know? <laughs> I thought you were going to know. But I think that we can often, yes, use these things to numb out and not face what we're really dealing with. So for me, I had to first realize it. But obviously, if you're asking the question, mm -hmm. you're aware. Because self-awareness is key right. during any of this. But self-awareness without action is basically just like nothing. Right. Mm -hmm. So you have to be self-aware and then willing to take action. And that's what they're asking. What's the action? Like for me, it was actively not participating in the behavior, whatever it was, how, I was. I guess for you, what kept you from going back to it? Because it was so easy at one point. Well, the rewiring my brain was what I had to do. I was had to get all in and I had to practice like really having a better understanding of my brain and what was happening helped me a lot and kind of, at least this is what I believed, what, what was happening. I know that for others, they might read Brain Over Binge and be like, wait, what? This is not resonating with me at all. But to me, it made perfect sense. Mm -hmm. And my brain needed to be rewired. And I had the ability to do that. Mm -hmm. And so every time I wanted to go and go to the pantry, I would go to the pantry and I would walk away. Mm -hmm. And I would go to the pantry and I would walk away. And sometimes I would go to the pantry and I mean, I might walk away from that thing like 500 times, mm -hmm. but the more I went to it and walked away, the more I was not going to use that as my medicine. Mm -hmm. Every time I walked away, it was almost also empowering too. And I wasn't perfect by any means. Well, there's perfect, the wrong word, because also there wasn't anything wrong with me if I actually did open the door. It's yeah. like, okay, there was no beating myself up. There was I no- I think that's key though. Uh, it's key. Like I wasn't, there. I didn't do anything wrong. I actually 
was in survival and my brain was taking care of me and I needed to do what I thought was best for me. But also I know that I am, I would remind myself of like, I am safe. I am nourished. I have food. I have like support. I have yeah. all these things. And I would go to the pantry and would walk away. I would go to the pantry and I would walk away. Go to the pantry and I would walk away. I'm going to keep saying that because that's what it felt like. I would yeah. go to the pantry and I would walk away because the pantry, that was my problem. Was Every time I would go to the pantry. And now, you know what? I can go to my pantry for comfort. Mm -hmm. But this is two years later. Mm -hmm. All right, sunny weather is upon us and the sun out means more time outside. My kids have sports. There's also swimming, hiking, going to the lake. And I'm always on the lookout for sun care that's easy for all of us. And that's where the new Banana Boat 360 coverage is coming to the rescue. It smells good. It is incredibly light on your skin. It is not greasy, which I think we can all appreciate. And it's an all new bottle with advanced control mist. It's a new way to spray. Better control means coverage that you can count on with a precision pump to get all your big and little spots. I mean, you can literally customize the spray. You just gotta tap the trigger lightly to cover targeted areas, or you can pull the trigger fully for a long continuous spray ensuring long-lasting Banana Boat protection. Banana Boat 360 coverage is also aerosol-free, which is a plus in my book for sure. It's available in Banana Boat's high-performance, water-resistant sport formula, and pediatrician-tested kids SPF 50. You can shop Banana Boat 360 Mist at Walmart, Target, or Amazon. When you're in the market for a new truck, you want a vehicle that can handle your daily grind. Navigate any terrain and haul with ease. You need the reliability of a Toyota and the confidence that your investment will last. Why? Because after all the hauling, towing, and hard work, you want a truck that still has plenty of miles left in it and holds its value for a great trade-in deal. That's where Toyota leads the pack. As the number one resale value brand for 2024, according to Kelly Blue Book's KBB.com. And both the 2024 Tacoma and Tundra are projected to retain their value over five years better than most. In fact, they're both in the top 10 of all vehicles for 2024, according to Kelly Blue Book's KBB.com. So remember, when you choose Toyota, you're not just buying a truck for today. You're investing in trade-in value for tomorrow. Visit buyatoyota.com. Vehicles projected resale value is specific to the 2024 model year. For more information, visit Kelly Blue Book's KBB.com. Kelly Blue Book is a registered trademark of Kelly Blue Book Company, Inc. Toyota, let's go places. When you have health insurance, it's easy to think, I'm covered, no worries, not so fast. Remember, your out-of-pocket costs are not covered by insurance. That can be a lot of money for your family. But how do you know you're not being overbilled? It's estimated that over 50% of medical bills contain errors. Unless you're a billing expert, how do you know your medical bills are accurate? HealthLock can help. HealthLock is a healthcare technology company that securely connects with your insurance. When your medical claims come in, health HealthLock Technology reviews the claims for errors like overbilling, wrong codes, and fraud. HealthLock makes it easy to find and fix hidden errors so you pay only what you owe. You can even have HealthLock work on your behalf to get money back from select past bills. To date, HealthLock has helped its members save over $130 million. Bottom line, insurance alone isn't enough. To save, visit HealthLock.com. Do it today before you see another healthcare provider. Oh, it's such a clutch pickup, Dave. I know, right? I was worried we'd bring back the same team. Oh, no, I meant those blackout motorized shades. MVP of the room. Blinds.com made it crazy affordable to replace our old blinds. Hard to install? No, it's easy. Even you could do it. Nice. I installed these and then got some for my mom, too. What, you fly across the country to do the install? Nope. Blinds.com can do it all. All she had to do was pick what she wanted. She talked to a design consultant for free and scheduled a professional measure and install. Look at you, Hall of Fame son. Oh, I just picked the winning team. They're the number one online retailer of custom window coverings in the world. Oh, Blinds.com is the GOAT. The GOAT. He shoots. He scores. Go to Blinds.com for up to 45% off and a 100% satisfaction guarantee. Go right now for up to 45% off at Blinds.com. Blinds.com. Rules and restrictions may apply. I can go to my pantry and find comfort in food, 
but I, there's not this guilt and shame associated with it. And I'm not, no, I'm not zombieing not out. I'm not numbing out. I'm not yeah. dissociating. I'm very yeah. aware. I'm actually like this cookie is doing its job right yeah. now. Amen. Mm-hmm. Love you cookies. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Where it used to be like, oh my gosh, I just ate a whole freaking box of cookies and I have no idea what happened. Mm-hmm. So for me, it was like, I don't want to do that anymore. So I had to just not do it. And I know that sounds so like, I. that's not advice, but it might be that I would turn, walk away from the pantry and go for a walk. Walk away from the pantry, call a friend. Walk away from the pantry, yeah. read my book. Walk away from the pantry, go read a blog about this. And so like, it's building other, it's one, you're, you're talking about, I'm not, going to beat myself up for no. for doing it no. because I, I feel very strongly about this. It is about consistency and not perfection. Right. So I want to be consistent in doing the things that actually are helpful, not perfect. So that's one of those releasing shame. The other thing is building up other things that help. So we get stuck on these things thinking that they're the only thing that helps and that becomes this like automatic reaction when there's tons of other skills out there that actually can really help you. And there's some different kinds of skills that can help and coping skills and there's types of therapy and DBT is really awesome to do. Now, when it comes down to it, I think what you're also saying without saying is you had to be willing to sit with a lot of discomfort and connect back to your life. That's, I think, the key for you and it was the key for me. And I couldn't do it on my own. I had to have accountability because connecting to my life and getting into the woods of what actually I thought my eating disorder was going to help me with was like a bloodbath. And I think that if you've never experienced this, you might have no idea what this feels or looks like, but like eating disorder recovery, really, I would describe it as an uphill bloodbath. It is so uncomfortable. It is so hard. Is it worth it? Yes. But it takes a lot of time to get to a place where my automatic thought isn't to beat myself up, isn't to go over exercise, isn't to like not eat for a certain amount of time, isn't to make a smoothie of water and kale. Like that's taken a long time for me to get that stuff out of the forefront of my brain. So accountability is key, but also willingness to sit in uncomfortable stuff and tolerate it. That's something I don't think is, we taught all these skills to like ignore or whatever, but it's like all about like, I need to learn how to tolerate being in my life. How do I tolerate being my life rather than going to go do something that takes me out of my life? So there's a lot of skills that can help with that, that that would take a whole podcast, but things that bring you into you and your experience rather pull me out of. And I think that the beating self up part like happens in stages. I mean, I, well, no, there's different things to beat yourself up about and you just can't do it in any category. Like Can I say something about Mm -hmm. in recovery? I kind of swap some things out for other things. Mm -hmm. Like I wasn't binging anymore, but I was counting macros. Mm -hmm. And I didn't realize I had replaced one for the other. Mm -hmm. I at least thought, well, I'm walking away from the pantry. I'm not binging, but now I'm obsessing over entering things into my fitness pal. Mm -hmm. And if I didn't enter it for the day, it's like, I was going to go crazy. Mm-hmm. Like it was so uncomfortable, but that in a way was another one of these coping mechanisms where I wasn't having to face what, because not being able to enter in the exact calories, fat, protein that I ate that day, carbs, shouldn't send me spinning. Mm-mm. It should be like, okay, cool. I couldn't enter that. I mean, because if you're in a place where you can enter that stuff and you want it just for facts mm-hmm. about your body, it's okay to want to know macros. Mm-hmm. But if, you're going to not be able to sleep. Not worth it. That's not, that's not worth it. But mm-hmm. I, I replaced, so I'm saying things can get sneaky because yeah. you can rewire one part of your brain and then brrr, like mm-hmm. move in in another way to yeah. numb out and not face the real things. Yeah. And mine was like disguised by, okay, I got to enter this or I have to eat this. Oh my gosh, I didn't meet my goal or steps. Like I'd be like, oh my gosh, I'm only at 9,557 steps and I'm supposed to get to 10,000 and I would pace around my bedroom. But I'm not binging. (laughs) Right, but But I didn't go to the pantry. That's what I think is actually really, I'm glad you said that because that's one of the reasons that I'm, I'm really, really big on if you're struggling with something like this and you're looking for help is find somebody who has experience and expertise in working in it because not all therapists and mental health professionals are created equal. If I didn't have experience in like the deep, deep, deep woods of eating disorders, I might congratulate you on that. 
and be like, I'm so proud of you. Look at you. You're getting over this. But I don't know the inside workings of eating disorders. And they're so freaking tricky that they can have you do things that a lot of the world celebrates. And then you're celebrating it. But it's actually, again, not helping you get to the root of the issue, which is the disconnection that you have with yourself and the inability to connect, which then prevents you from connecting to other people. So, I remember when Lisa had me stop doing that because I was doing her program and I had completed Brain Over Binge and I had completed Fork the Noise, but yet I was still sneaking in my mm-hmm. my data. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and she's like, Amy, you have to stop. Because you, and what you didn't I, learn is how to tolerate the discomfort. Yes. And I told her, I can't let this go. Mm-hmm. I don't see how this is harming me and I can't let it go. But then when I really sat back with it, the mere fact that I couldn't let it go meant that it was harmful. Yeah. And I remember struggling with sleep the first night I let it go. And the next morning waking up and sending Lisa a text. And I'm like, I don't know how I'm going to get through today. Like not tracking everything. And then I think I had taken a picture at work and I sent it to her. And I'm like, ugh, I already feel like I look different. And she's like, Amy, you look the same. Mm-hmm. But I couldn't see it. Mm-hmm. So then... You know, this is just to say. But that also just, you're seeing how you feel and you're uncomfortable. Right. And you're having all this, these messages inside of your body shooting off because you have not learned how to tolerate this feeling. You're feeling all over the place and, and oh my gosh, scared, all this stuff. You're seeing an image of that. And so all of a sudden you think you look different when like it's impossible. It's, it was impossible. Yeah. Literally impossible. And so I would just say, if you're looking to not fall back into other behaviors, you might pick up other things that you think are safe. Yeah. And then you realize, oh, shoot, they're not safe either. So yeah, just make sure you have good accountability, like you were saying, Kat, and things in place. And it's okay to be prepared or have a list of things or journal and write. Mm -hmm. Like, journaling, writing, reading, like sometimes writing things out. I think that that's, if you can walk away from a behavior and go and journal it all down, that can be extremely therapeutic and help you connect the dots yeah. with your, within yourself, which is ultimately what you're saying is we have to do. We can't just replace one yeah. numbing behavior with another numbing behavior. And then like, what are things that you say to go do for this well, I, I believe it's very important to have a box full of tools, like a box full of things and not just one or two things that work because we can't be journaling every time we feel distressed. We right. can't be going for a walk every time we feel distressed. We can't be calling a friend every time. So having a toolbox of a lot of different options. Ooh, but- you could do a grab bag. <laughs> <laughs> Write them all down. You draw one. Ooh, what do I get to do Wait, today? I used to actually make like <laughs> emergency kits with clients where um, we would put a bunch of stuff in like a little bag or they could get like a cute fun, they could get a four things bag or something um, and put them all in there. And we would have things that would bring them into their senses. So uh, a a picture to look at, a a stone or something soft to hold, um, a scent to smell. And it's bringing uh, you back into the present of that rather than like going in the, you know, when you're really, really stressed and triggered, you're like all over the place and a lot of times living in your past. So self-soothing things are really, really helpful, but self-soothing doesn't take away your emotions. So something that I always have in my office, and I actually have it at my house too, is I keep things in the freezer like um, citrus fruits, like lemons, oranges, limes. And when you're really, use the word, triggered to go use a behavior, you go get that and you hold it and you self-soothe it, you still might be feeling scared or sad or angry, but you're also self-soothing in that moment. So I actually was going to say this because I was watching Inside Out last night with my niece. And I don't know if you guys have seen it, but basically uh, sadness, the feeling sadness is a huge part of the movie. And spoiler alert, if you haven't seen it, you can fast forward through this part. But at the end it showed us that um, sadness was a really important part of this girl's life and emotional literacy. And my niece uh, looked at me, she's seven, and she was like, wait, because there were, uh, your feelings were categorized by different colors. And these marbles that were categorized by different colors were being changed to have both the color for joy and both the color for sadness in it. And my niece looked at me and she said, Aunt Kat, why are they turning all of her happy thoughts sad? 
And I said, well, look what's happening. Because there was a scene in the movie where the girl was really sad, but her parents gave her a hug and comforted her. Mm. And I said, look what's happening. She's really, really sad. But because she was sad and expressed that to her family, they came to her, hugged her, and now they're like spending time with her. And now she feels love and she feels joy. So sometimes when you're sad, it's not all bad. It can lead you to something you really want. And so for this girl, it was connection with her family. Mm. And I I don't know why that's making me emotional right now. But I, when she asked me that, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm so grateful for this movie. But that's literally what I'm talking about. How can I sit in this emotion and sit in this feeling and not like demonize it? Because our discomfort is probably hitting on some kind of emotion we're having that we don't know how to tolerate, whether that's sadness or fear or anger. And we need to learn that our emotions lead us to what we really need and what we really want rather than lead us to like this deep, dark hole. That makes me think of halt. It's like a little bit different, but another thing where you you might be acting or feeling a certain way because H, you might be hungry. A, you might be angry. L, you might be lonely. Or T, you might be tired. And I think of how many of the years I lived in a state of just like, ugh. Mm-hmm. I don't even have a word for it. It was just like, ugh. And But people wouldn't have even really known. But I was that probably because I was tired and hungry <laughs> and angry and lonely. Like I was all, I mean, some of those, yeah. if you're like on any given day, you can know if you're feeling a certain way, you can be like, wait, am I hungry, angry, lonely, tired? And it's a tool for you to meet your needs. Mm-hmm. But like when I was in the thick of my eating disorder, I was halt all the time, all four things. But you never actually clued into that. So I'm just going to behavior. So I'm not actually figuring out what do I need here? Right. But I mean, look at all those needs. Yeah. And I, but I wasn't meeting any of them. I was numbing all of it out. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, I was hungry, but whatever. I don't, I'm not eating right now. Or if I'm hungry, then okay, I just overate and da, da, da. And I'm angry about it all. Mm -hmm. And I'm lonely because I feel it's very isolating and nobody's Mm -hmm. talking about it. And then I'm freaking tired. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like, so so maybe you just need a nap. Well, yeah, but I mean, it's just a cycle. It's a vicious cycle that makes you really exhausted. Yeah. I just remember being so exhausted all the time because either thinking about food or not thinking about food or trying not to think about food. or Because running away from yourself is exhausting. And I think that like running away from yourself is exhausting. Eating disorder recovery is exhausting, but there is a light at the end of the tunnel. And you don't have to live in that state of exhaustion forever. Right. Well, yeah. Circling back to like where I want to put a bow on the halt thing is, is like now I might experience multiple of those things at once, but it's very rare. I think that most of my eating disorder, though I lived in Mm -hmm. all of them, Mm -hmm. hungry, angry, lonely, tired. Mm -hmm. And now I can tell, I can like tell a difference. If I'm actually hungry, I'm like, okay, well, that's hungry. Or if I'm snippy, I'm like, okay, do I need food or is it that I'm angry? And I can like... Mm-hmm. decipher mm-hmm. what it is. Again, I might have some of them that are crossing over, yeah. but it's rare. Like what, because I'm more connected, it's like I'm able to narrow it down and figure out oh, are what your this need is. Yeah. And then I'm able to feel my feelings mm-hmm. and be like, it's okay. And then I go and I have the day I need to have. <laughs> <laughs> How many things can you say that um, are like catchphrases of yeah. mine in one sentence? I don't know. Uh, but I don't, yeah. you know, I do want to offer that hope and that light at the end of the tunnel is that when you're in recovery, it's not perfect. You still have days where you're angry, lonely, tired, and hungry. Oh, yeah. But like, it's less exhausting because you're, it's more manageable. It just is. I don't know. I'm speaking for myself. Like I was a freaking hot mess, mm-hmm. but also I was trying to hold it together all the time. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, it's just, oh, if you're there, I get it you're not alone. I want you to know that. And I just also want people to know that it's going to take time. It's but not it's, as easy as a lot of the mm-hmm. stuff you're seeing uh, on the internet makes it look. And it's I, not I, black and white. It's, it's so not. gray. And that's why, I mean, even that's what outweighs about. Yeah. It's like the gray area of eating disorders. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And there's not one way for everybody. And even some of the stuff we're saying here, yeah. you might need to assess for yourself what's going to work, what's not going to work. And that's the beauty of working with someone like Kat. If you can find a licensed therapist in the city where you live that you can actually like meet with that specializes yeah. in eating disorders because I've definitely gone to therapists before that I don't know I just didn't feel comfortable because they didn't 
They didn't well, get it. We're talking about like individualized treatment too. And I think that's really important where like I work with a lot of people with eating disorders and I don't do the same thing with all of them because based on their experience, their life, their behaviors, they need different things. And that's why it's actually really hard to answer some of the questions that you guys send specifically about eating disorders is because there isn't one answer I can give that fits everybody. So I, I do want to throw that out there as we wrap this up that... Sorry, take, this is so long. Yeah, <laughs> we were going to do three or four. We got two questions, but <laughs> that's okay. They were, it was good conversation, but take what we're saying and make sure it really does fit with you before you make it like your life's motto now. And your therapist might not always be 100% correct. So if you're with a therapist that does, you wouldn't know this, but does every single thing the same with every single client, that's a red flag because I don't see how that would ever work. No, well, I don't see how that would work either. No. I mean, even as I, if I have the same therapist, I want them to do different things for me in different seasons. Yeah. Yeah. Like if yeah. I'm seeing them for a long time, mm -hmm. you need to, okay. Spice it up. Evolve with me. Yeah. Let's go. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, Pat, this is your episode. I'll you in. <laughs> but I'm like, okay, sorry. We went way over. We were going to do this for 20 minutes, but I don't know how long this is. But it was a good conversation. And I'm grateful to have it. And I'm grateful that you are somebody that is willing to have these conversations because they are vulnerable and hard and, and scary. And also look at how much goodness and connection you've gotten from talking about this stuff. Yeah, like, for sure. It's amazing. Uh, I wish we had time for more questions. I feel like each question though, I could spend 30 minutes with you on it and maybe we'll do an, another Q&A episode soon. But if y'all have emails or thoughts, you can send them to us. Hello at outweighpodcast.com. That's hello at outweighpodcast.com. It's also in the show notes. But Kat, thank you so much. Thank you for and doing this. And always appreciate you. Y'all can follow Kat on Instagram. She's at Kat, K-A-T dot Defata, D-E-F-A-T-T-A. And then also her podcast is You Need Therapy. Definitely check that out. She recently did a series on attachment styles that I found to be fascinating and interesting, which, you know, learning about yourself and more about kind of how you operate can help you in your eating disorder recovery. So if you haven't heard of attachment styles, you know what I'm talking about? Well, go listen because there's some episodes up there for you. And if you know what we're talking about, then go listen anyway because hopefully it'll be helpful. All right. Thank you. And I hope you all have a great rest of your weekend and we'll see you next Saturday. All right, this sun season, evolve your sun care with new Banana Boat 360 coverage. With Advanced Control Mist, it's a new way to spray. It's an all-new bottle for an all-new mist experience that smells great and is incredibly light on your skin. You can even customize your spray. Like, to cover targeted areas, you just tap the trigger lightly, or you can pull the trigger fully for a long, continuous spray, ensuring long-lasting Banana Boat protection. Plus, it's refillable from sweat resistant sport formula to kids SPF 50 plus. This is sun care that'll come in handy when my kids are swimming, playing sports, when I'm hiking, when we're out at the lake or whatever it is that we're doing outdoors. Shop Banana Boat 360 Mist at Walmart, Target or Amazon. State Farm and DJ Dramos from Life as a Gringo know that getting your money right brings freedom, empowerment and future success. It's like we have to unlearn, as we do in every other part of our lives, but financially unlearn a lot of the BS that we were taught that holds us back from getting the sort of lifestyle that we want and being able to live the comfortable, financially free lifestyle that I'm sure all of us are striving for. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. What's up, y'all? Janice Torres here. And I'm Austin Hankwitz. We're the hosts of Mind the Business, Small Business Success Stories, a podcast presented by iHeartRadio's Ruby Studios and Intuit QuickBooks. Join us as we speak with small business owners about the tools they use to turn their ideas into success. From finding that initial spark of entrepreneurship to organizing payments and invoices, we've got you covered. So follow and listen to Mind the Business, Small Business Success Stories on the iHeartRadio app or wherever you get your podcasts. You've probably heard a lot about electrified vehicles lately. Well, Toyota has electrified options for every lifestyle. We've got hybrids, no plug right, needed. Let's go. But we also have plug-in hybrids, if that's your thing. <laughs> you can even go 100% electric in the Toyota BZ4X. 
with so many options for reducing carbon emissions. Toyota is electrified, diversified. Oh, oh, oh. Learn more about our Beyond Zero vision for the future at toyota.com slash beyondzero.